Hi everyone, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, my name is Joya Mukuchi. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Japanese American National Museum. Um, and on behalf of the museum, I just want to welcome you to the program here tonight. Thank you to all the friends who are here in person, in the audience, and to everyone on the live stream. Um, we're so excited to have you here joining us in from online. And if online you want to let us know where you're calling in from, um, we'll let our panelists know where people are watching from. Um, a special thank you to all of our members who are watching. Your support is really what allows us to keep putting on programs like this. Um, and we're so grateful that you've stuck with us through all this time. Um, and if you're interested in becoming a member, please let us know. You can check out our website um, and find all more information online or speak to one of our staff members. Um, we also want to let you know that we do have a couple exhibitions. You'll be hearing, of course, about um, A Life in Pieces, the letters, uh, the Diary and Letters of Stanley Hayami tonight, so I don't think I need to talk too much more about that one. But please also come and see um, Nino Yokobo's masterpiece, which explores that artist's um, work, um, this kind of seminal work of, that he made coming out of camp during World War II. Um, and it's a really gorgeous and exciting new exhibit that we have here. Um, and of course, the, our museum store is also open online as well, so please check that out. Some of the things we're talking about tonight will also be available in the store. Um, and with that, um, for our folks here in the audience, please just keep your masks on at all times um, and uh, keep social distance as much as possible so you can keep everyone healthy and safe here. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over as this program is a program of the Japanese American National Museum, but as part of the Japanese American Consortium 2021 Educational Conference. I'm going to pass it over to Mia Russell, who will tell us a little more about the conference and kick this program off tonight. Thank you, Joy. Welcome and good evening. I'm Mia Russell, the manager of the Japanese American Confinement Sites Consortium, a national network of organizations working to preserve sites and artifacts related to the Japanese American incarceration during World War II and dedicated to interpreting this history for the benefit of public education. Among our initiatives, we build the capacity of our member organizations, defend against threats to historic sites, structures, artifacts, and organizations, and advocate for programs that help preserve and interpret this important chapter in our nation's history. Tonight's program is the opening program for our 2021 JAX Consortium Education Conference. We are grateful to our hosts, the Japanese American National Museum, and to the Aratani Foundation for their support of our program. Founded on the idea that we are stronger together than on our own, the conference aims to bring together practitioners in preservation, education, and advocacy related to the Japanese American experience. So thank you all for joining us, and to all of our participants and panelists tonight and this weekend uh, for contributing your talents and insights for an inspiring weekend. And now I'll turn the program over to Clement Hanani. Thank you, Mia. It's always interesting because Mia actually works here at the museum too, so she has to <laughs> she's welcome welcome everybody, not just from JASC, but also from the Japanese American National Museum. So, hello, my name is Clement Hanani, and I'm the Vice President of Exhibitions at the Japanese American National Museum, and we are very excited, let me just say, we're very excited to be hosting the opening, okay. Well, that, that's okay, because you don't want to hear me. such an interesting time. I, I say the same thing sometimes when I see people's faces for the book, I'm going, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Lows sometimes is so quite surprising. So hopefully we're still not on the street.
virtually. We're, we're glad that still a lot of people are online. So Evan, will you give me a thumbs up? Hello, Evan Kodani. Okay, so we are back. Um, hopefully everything is okay on the live stream. Again, my name is Clement Hanami from the Japanese American National Museum, and I am very pleased to be presenting the opening program of the Japanese American Confinement Sites Consortium 2021 Educational Conference. And we're very lucky today to have, as part of our program, Through Stanley's Eyes, Telling Stories of Heart Mountain. And this will be a two-part program. First, part of the program will be with Judy Hayami, who's the daughter of Walt Hayami, um, who is Stanley's younger brother, who survived um, the concentration camps. Not, not Stanley, but Walt, and then we also have Dakota Russell, who is the executive director of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Interpretive Center in uh, Wyoming. Heart Mountain Interpretive Center in Wyoming. And so the, those two will give us a perspective of the experiences of Heart Mountain, and then that'll be followed by another um, panel with some of the creatives that went into the making of A Life in Pieces, the virtual reality piece that um, is featured in the exhibition, A Life in Pieces. So I'm gonna start with, this, with uh, questions for our two panelists, our first two panelists, Judy Hayami and Dakota Russell. Um, the first one is for Dakota. What was life like for teenagers in Heart Mountain and, and, the, w, and, Heart Mountain and the WRA camps? Because we know at the time, Stanley was only 16 years old. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is something that we don't tend to think about a lot, um, is what was life life for kids, you know? And this is very much a teenaged experience because people don't consider that over half of the population of Park Mountain, over half of those incarcerated there were under 18. And a fair degree of those were actually teenagers. And uh, for them, it was, you know, in many ways a heartbreaking experience because just at the time of life when they were coming into their prime, they were torn away from their high schools, their social groups, uh, and uh, put out here in the middle of, of the high desert in Wyoming. Um, but it's surprising the ways in that it also uh, looked like normal teenage life out there after a while, you know. At first it was really problematic and people had trouble adjusting, but eventually schools were established within the camps, uh, you know, and eventually you started to have clubs form among the teenagers, you know, if they were literary clubs or weightlifting clubs, uh, poetry clubs, um, swing dancing clubs. Uh, you know, and, and even just social clubs that started to pop up amongst uh, these teens here. And, you know, there would be dances in the barracks on Saturday nights. Uh, there would be the aspects of teenage life that you would expect to see in the 1940s. And uh, so while it was a very heavy experience, they also were able to build some sort of community within there, which I think helped a lot of them to be able to get through and survive very difficult time for teenagers, not just in the camps, but you know, it was a time of war and a time when there were tough decisions to make and, and they had to think about those as well. Thanks, Dakota. Um, I'm always, I always marvel at Dakota's answers because you know, people ask like, why is Dakota Russell that hard mountain? <laughs> but he is such an incredible researcher and such a knowledgeable individual and his board were probably all teenagers when they were in camp. So he has so many incredible stories just from his amazing work that he does at Heart Mountain. Many of uh, them which I can't repeat here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I learned, I learned something every time I listen to Dakota speak. Um, but that takes us into the sort of the, the, the life of teenagers and the idea of, you know, this whole exhibition really is based on a diary 
you know, sort of the inside thoughts of a young teenager named Stanley. And I wanted to ask Judy a question about um, how did the family come to the conclusion to make the, the diaries public? Was that something you guys talked about? And was it a difficult decision? It was more um, between my father, Walter, and the oldest brother, Stanley's oldest brother, Frank, and his sister, Sachi. But growing up, uh, we lived closest to my grandparents. And the diary was at their house, as I remember as a, I mean, even before high school, it was just crammed in a little bookcase. And it was always there next to the Bible and some other things. And at one time or another, all of my siblings had read it. But it, I don't know, for whatever reason, it, it didn't resonate with me as deeply as it did my younger brothers, and particularly my brother Dan, who kind of rediscovered it after we moved my grandmother into a house behind our house, um, he found it in the garage in a box and uh, brought it to my dad's attention. He said, do you know about this? And dad said, oh yeah, I, I know what it is. And my father said that he had even taken it to one of his teachers after they got out of camp and said uh, for her to read. And she said, this is important. This is something that you should take care of. So it, it just kind of fell by the wayside until my brother Dan found it again and, and told my dad, it is something special, and it shouldn't be in a box in the garage. So um, at the time, there was no Japanese American National Museum. So although everybody thought, you should do something with this, you should take it to somebody, show it to somebody, it's like, where do you go with it? So after the museum uh, was established, dad asked his older brother and sister you know, he said, I think this is where it belongs, that we should donate it to the museum rather than just have it kicking around and end up in somebody else's box in a garage. And so they said yes. And I don't, I don't know that it was difficult. I mean, yes, it was a very personal item. But on the other hand, it, it was something that they felt strongly enough about that it, it needed to be known. It needed to be shared. So dad donated it to the museum. And... Um, the letters from my Aunt Grace, that was a little harder to come by. She was, um, I don't want to say more possessive, but she kept saying, no, these are personal. These are very personal, and they are. He wrote, Stanley wrote to my Aunt Grace uh, after he stopped writing in the first diary because he was then in the service, and so he write, would write letters back to his parents and to my dad and to Aunt Grace, and she saved I think probably every letter he ever wrote to her. And they are much more personal because it's between a brother and a sister. And he, I think he felt more comfortable sharing the reality of his experience as a soldier with her than he did because he didn't want to worry his parents. And so I think he's, he had expressed a lot of things in the letters that were probably just between the two of them. Um, so I don't know that it was a difficult decision. It just seemed like the right thing to do for my dad. And um, so it came to be, but I'm glad it is where it is because it is being shared on a much larger basis than we ever could have imagined. And I'm, all of us, I think, in my family, we're just surprised that it's resonated the way it has with so many people. Thank you, Judy. Um, I can say from the museum's perspective, we have more than 150,000 objects in our collection. But we do have a list of 10 items that are the most important than if there's ever a fire or a flood that we would rescue and save those. And of course, Stanley's diary is one of those mm -hmm. top 10s, for sure. Um, so thank you. That's a great, great ex well, thank answer, you. too. Thank you to the museum. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, my next question is actually for both of you. And I think you were starting to touch on that, um, Judy, is <laughs> Why is it that do you think, why, why do you think it is that Stanley's art and writing continues to resonate even with people today? Well, that's a harder question. Because um, he was an ordinary guy, I think. And everything he did, he did with enthusiasm. He had certainly a sense of humor. You can tell by the, by the things that he wrote and by, just by his illustrations. He was not stuck on himself by any means. He had a lot, of, a lot of doubts, a lot of concerns. And I think it's something that everybody goes through probably at his age, trying to figure out who you are, what you mean to the world, what you can do for other people. 
And uh, I think that hits home with a lot of people that may even still be searching. I think they feel um, comfortable, comfortable. He's not on a pedestal and he's not um, overly ambitious, but I do think he was very open-minded for someone of his age thinking about a United Nations and space travel and things like that. But I think it's just maybe the kid in him that makes him so relatable. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. I think that, you know, there is something that's really universal about it, you know, and, and about his struggles. And when he talks about, you know, this is this is what I want to do with my life. This is where I feel like I can make an impact. But, you know, I think it also cannot be, uh, we can't understate that uh, Stanley's also, for his age, just an extraordinary writer to begin with. And even though these are intimate entries that for the most part he's writing for himself or in the case of the letters he's writing for his family just his descriptions of things are so vivid and he's so thoughtful in the way that he presents things that it really gives you an insight into what's going through his mind at that time and so um it's not somebody who is presenting it as if they, you know, know everything that's to be known about the world. As as Judy said, he's still figuring it out, and he's very forthright about that. But um, he presents it in such a way that that he sort of takes you on that journey with him, and I think that's really special. Yeah, I, I completely uh, understand what Judy was saying about. I, I feel like when people read Stanley's diary, you know. At first, you're reading Stanley's diary, but after a while, people really do connect with it, and it's not, not a Japanese-American person's diary. It's just an American's diary. And it, it resonates so personally with people that I know that they are moved emotionally by the injustices that he had gone through, but he was remained so optimistic throughout all of the confusion and the chaos. So thank you. Those are all great, great answers. Um, for Dakota, Stanley writes a lot about his feelings towards the U.S. government and whether serving in the military is the right thing to do. Can you tell us a little bit about what was happening at Heart Mountain that made these conflicts so present in his mind? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is one of the things that's really amazing about Stanley's diary when you understand where it's being written at is that Heart Mountain has become a hotbed of discussion about civil rights at the time that he's writing. And, you know, there is, of course, uh, now teenagers are starting to be drafted, young men are starting to be drafted into the armed forces from the camp. And there are a lot of people in the camp that welcome this, that said, this is great, this is a way that we're going to go out and prove our loyalty uh, to the United States and prove that Japanese Americans are just as American as anybody else. But there's also this segment of the Heart Mountain population that says, no, having to prove your loyalty is the antithesis of what it means to be an American, you know? And that they have determined to resist the draft, that they are, are not going to show up uh, for their physicals there. And this is the Hard Mountain Fair Play Committee, which sort of forms the, the core of the draft resistance movement at Hard Mountain. And throughout Stanley's writings, you can sort of see those uh, two forces within Hard Mountain kind of playing on his mind as he negotiates it himself and figures out where he personally stands on this. And this is what I mean when I say Stanley is extraordinary, is that he gives a lot of thought to this question as he goes through it, um, you know, and ultimately arrives at something so nuanced, you know, which is that he realizes that you know, in some ways, American democracy has failed the Japanese Americans here. But even though it may have failed him personally, he still believes in the promise of American democracy. He believes in what it could be. And that's what he determines to go out and fight for. Um, which, again, as I talk about, it's just the way that he works his way through these decisions, you know, is is, is so insightful and... Uh, you know, I think that there are a lot of people that you could have read their diaries and they would have said, oh, well, everybody I know thinks this, so that's what I think too, you know, or, or uh, the other way around. But Stanley really is concerned with it as an individual decision and figuring out as a man, where does he stand? And I think that's what makes him so interesting to read. Thank you, Dakota. 
Um, and to, to build on that, um, Judy, so as Dakota so eloquently states, you know, his inner thoughts become such talking points for these issues of democracy and justice and stuff like that. How do you and others of your family um, remember his legacy? Now, you know, now that it's being discussed more and more and more, it just continues to amaze me how um, it continues to grow. So how does that impact your family and some of your ideas? Well, I can't really speak for all of them, but I know, um, I often wonder, did he really know what he was getting into? I mean, he, he felt like it was the right thing to do and he wanted to do his part for the country and he didn't like being confined, although you don't hear bitterness in anything that he wrote. And I, I don't know, it just was his personal decision. I, I know my grandmother was very reluctant that he was going or eager to go. I know he also looked to, up to his Uncle Frank, um, my Uncle Frank, his older brother, and Frank was going, so you know he was going to go. Um, I, I, it's hard to say. His legacy is just that, I mean, we all see him as a hero, but I think anybody that, that has a son or a daughter that commits to service of their country is, is worthy of that title. But I mean, it's sad that he didn't come home. <laughs> That's what I keep thinking. Um, it was great what he did, and and I know his heart was in it, but it's just, um, for me, it's just an uncle I never met. That's kind of selfish, I know. <laughs> no. Well, I do think it underlines this idea of, <laughs> you know, these are very young men. These are These are... <laughs> young men in the sense that they haven't been men for very long right. that we're sending off to fight in this war, you know, and, and many of them don't come back. And, yeah. and I, I think that's, that's really one of the big takeaways from it. It is, because then when you read the part of the diary where he's talking about walking past dead German soldiers, and it's not the dead ones you worry about, it's the ones that are still moving. It's just like he was willing to go and face I mean, like I said, did he really know what he was getting into? But then once he was in the situation, he was all in. And it's like the, the 442nd, their motto was go for broke. And I think it's just, it's that kind of um, ambition just to be the best you can and, and to do the best you can. Um, certainly that's part of his legacy. And I think that most of us in the family have tried to, to keep that up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I really, in having read all the letters and just looking at the way he was thinking, I, I, I feel exactly like you guys are saying, a lot of it for me was really his character. And to me, that came from Frank and Ayano. It came from the parents, you know, mm -hmm. the whole family. There was such a strong sense of character in um, Stanley that he he would do like Dakota said. He would go wrestle these difficult decisions, but he would always come out on top because he was making them based on his character. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just a great. You know, it's very sad, like Judy said, to to lose someone of such high standards. So can, can I say one more sure. something else too? And I know I've said this before, but he wrestled for what his path was going to be, what his profession, what his career was going to be, and he always aspired to be an artist writer was his final decision, as you read in the diary, and it's, it's because of what the diary has become since the museum took possession of it and has taken care of it, that he unknowingly achieved his ultimate ambition. That is that's true. It's, that's such a, that's a very insightful comment. Um, and Judy mentions that part where he, he does come to that conclusion. There's a passage near there where he talks about being inspired by George Washington Carver. And for me, like Booker T and George Washington Carver are all amazing people who have inspired my life. So to know that he was inspired by these great people just makes me, and, and the fact that he was a Bruin fan, I think is another important thing. So, um, But okay, so we, we're, we'll be closing now, but what I wanna ask the final question for both of you is, what should young people take away from Stanley's story? Start with Dakota. 
Well, I think that one of the big takeaways I would say is that you could make more of a difference than you realize, you know, in the scheme of things, you know, um, as, as Stanley puts it, his life's just flicker in eternity, right? Um, it's, it's just uh, a, a small grain of dust in the, in the bigger cosmic situation there. But, you know, his life, his thoughts are still influencing us today. They are still moving us today, you know. Um, and, and right down to, to the way he died helping others, you know, going back again and again to help uh, his fellow soldiers there. Um, it really speaks to his character and who he was as a person as well. And I think that, you know, no matter how small we feel at times, we all have the power to, to make an impact in ways that we may not even realize at the time. And I, I think that's important for young folks who, who sometimes feel insignificant to know. Um, I asked my nephew the same question. He's here today. He's 18. And he said that what he got out of Stanley's personality and his attitude and his thinking was to make the best of a bad situation, a tough situation. Look for the good in it. Look for what you can do, what you can achieve on your own. And always, always do your best. Try your hardest and do your best. Um, I think I think those are things that Stanley really did take to heart and exemplify. You could see how he worried about his grades and everything. And, and uh, yeah, that, that's true. And I think also because he had a social conscience too, which kind of surprised me for being 17, 18 years old, um, that he was concerned about other people so much, about the world in general. And so to younger people that I think talk talk to your grandparents, talk to your parents, ask them about things like this, how they grew up and the things that affected them, because these stories will die unless we make an effort to absorb them and, and spread the word or share them with other people. And to grandparents and parents out there, tell them really how you felt. Don't just say this happened, this happened, this. Tell them what an impact it had on you so they can carry that with them because that will make a difference too. I couldn't have said that any better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judy, that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, so with that, we're gonna close this portion, but please, we're gonna bring them back at the end for question and answers. So think about your questions. If you're on the YouTube chat, just go ahead and put your questions in there. Or if you're here, you can ask the questions. But we're gonna do a, sl a slight changeover from our two guests, Dakota Russell and Judy Hayami, to our creatives that are in the audience. So I think Evan's gonna be playing a short video while we do this changeover. Yeah. Today was the day last year in which this whole mess started. <laughs> Pearl Harbor bombed. We did not go through the processes of law. They didn't have any evidence. Right now, I'm probably the most confused man boy alive. I'm mixed up about everything. I hope the war ends this year. Today, I am writing my first entry in this journal. It is no special day, but I have to start somewhere. Okay, thank you. That was a beautiful piece taken from the elements of the Life in Pieces VR piece, edited by Evan Kodani, but created by Emblematic. And um, we are going to be, unfortunately, Noni de, Nani de la Pena couldn't be here tonight. 
um, she had a, a family emergency at the last minute. But so we have a recording of her talking about um, some of the ideas behind um, the cr making of uh, a life in pieces, as well as how it affected her personally. Um, so with that, I'm going to have a uh, Che do a uh, roll the video, please. Hi, I'm Nani de la Pena, and um, my son was 15 years old, about the same age as Stanley Hayami, when I first started working on this project. Um, I watched my son come of age during the making of this piece, which took us three years. Um, and it made it all the more poignant that I watched my son go from being a boy to a man. Um, and I thought about how Stanley Hayami had to go through that process, living in basically a concentration camp, um, even more heartbreaking for me. Um, the project really came to me um, when two uh, individuals were working at my uh, company emblematic group, Kevin Ski and Craig Fuji and uh, Craig Fuji and Craig um, and uh, Kevin um, were really interested in this project, but the way things go, right? Um, time goes by and, and we had the whole um, team from the museum and everybody over to see the kind of pieces we made. And um, eventually we were able to get enough funding to make something in virtual reality, which is a which is a very um, intensive effort uh, to make any kind of content work. Uh, I was really lucky that Judy Hayami um, agreed to be my narrator, and that we were able to cast somebody like Kurt, um, who I know you're going to meet tonight, um, as Stanley. Kurt was fantastic. And um, we had Sharon Yamato, who worked with me closely. She uh, made the um, wonderful documentary, Flicker and Eternity, about Stanley. And then Sharon and I could really bounce ideas about the script off of one another. Um, and sometimes I would just call Sharon up and just cry because the story was so heartbreaking. Um, making things in what we call game engine or real time is requires C-sharp coding, requires um, hours and days and weeks of, of um, programming. It also uh, involved capturing what's called photogrammetry, um, a model of an interior of an actual barrack. We actually did some capturing in Manzanar. Um, Jonathan Yamayuza worked on that and he ended up in an intense heat in Manzanar capturing that. So he in many ways experienced firsthand what some of the concentration camp victims um, went through. Um, and that's why I would certainly refer to this as concentration camp victims. Um, but I think for Stanley, he would really have loved that his story was being told in virtual reality. Stanley was really into things like rocket ships and spaceships and thinking about the future and the future of mankind. Um, we certainly read from his diary, talk uh, about the you know idea that he had that um, maybe one day molecules could be radioed up to Europe and, and he could go to Egypt or other places. Um, and, you know, it's kind of what we're doing, right? This piece, uh, a digital piece that tells Stanley's story, has been sent all over the globe already. It's gone to New York and London, Taiwan, to Cannes, Tribeca Film Festival. It's going to Hawaii and uh, other people are interested in showing it. So Stanley's digital form of this story is um, actually has been radioed all over the planet. Um, hopefully one day it'll be in Egypt even. Um, the other thing about Stanley is that he was an incredible artist and um, using a new technology called Quill, we had to take his drawings, his art, and turn them into animations, but not just flat, normal animations. These are animations you get to walk around and walk through. Uh, and that, again, was um, many, many, many hours of effort uh, on the um, part of um, Haley Tomasik, whose grandfather was in Boston, actually. She was a young artist who I brought in and trained in the studio to um, use his technologies. But I think she did an incredible job of translating Stanley's art. So um, I hope that you'll be able to get a chance to see the piece yourselves. You'll get to see the incredible exhibition that uh, Clement Hanami put together um, for this VR piece. Um, and um, just want to thank Janum for the opportunity to work on such an incredible story.
Okay. Thank you, Nani, even though you're not here. I know you are here in heart. Um, and just for people, um, Nani was a really amazing uh, company to work with, Emblematic. Um, she was very passionate, very collaborative, um, and you know, she was very process-based. We did do a lot of feedback and comments on all the different edits and write-ups that her and Sharon were working on. Um, it was never done in a box, but always, you know, back and forth to make sure that, you know, the story could resonate. Um, and I will say, she doesn't mention this, but she mentions how the VR um, piece is very complex and heavy and has a lot of elements going. She doesn't mention that during the pandemic, you know, we, we approached her and said, you know, we're worried about people sharing devices and their feelings about this. And if there was a way to make it streaming, which, you know, when you think about trying to put all these, you know, gigabytes into <laughs> megabytes and have it stream seamlessly on YouTube, it's kind of daunting, but their team was able to do that and without any complaints. And really what it did was make the access of Stanley's story that much larger now because when I when we travel the show, it doesn't just have to be a, a, a headset and a computer. All you need is Wi-Fi to be able to view the 360 degree video piece. And so we're grateful for their commitment to sharing that story. And like she mentioned with the um, the, the satellite thing, you know, it is going to all these, it, it literally is international with all of the, um, the film festivals that all the uh, that this piece is going to, we, we get emails all the time, and it'll be in Honolulu in about a week. Right? So yeah, it's just been everywhere: Europe, Hawaii, Asia, America. So okay, so those, with that, we're going to turn to our two participants that are here, the creatives, I call them, because no no piece is made without their talents that are that take the diary and bring it to life. Um, and so one of those people is Sharon Yamato, who is an author, writer, and an exhibition creator herself, as well as Kurt Kanazawa, who is an actor, singer, probably a many of all different creative talents. He's also a visual artist and a photographer. Um, so, and they were involved in the creation of the VRP. So my first question is for Sharon. So you have already been involved in a number of Stanley's storytelling projects like a book, a movie, and now the VR piece. You are like the sort of the resident expert on Stanley Hayami. Um, how has this story evolved or remained the same? Um, I think your explanation of uh, the traveling of this piece means a lot because it is different from the film, which we, which I had to look up. We did, we, um, Anne Konecla and I did this film 10 years ago. And it, luckily, we're going to get to show it again because of the um, interest in Stan, the, re, the, the upturn, upturn of interest in Stanley Hayami. So we, we're going to be showing it at the museum here at Janum on December 4th. So I hope some of you are able to come. But anyway, it's called A Flicker in Eternity. There's a... Um, I was approached by Joanne Oppenheim, who wrote the book, uh, uh, basically excerpting or including everything from Stanley's diary. So if you don't get enough of it in a short film or in a VR piece, you can actually read it in its entirety in her book. Um, the thing about this story, which I know we've said over and over again, but when I first was introduced to it by Joanne, I looked at the book and I said, not a problem. This is made for film. This story is so visual. It is so, I mean, his animations or his drawings are so wonderfully um, illustrative of the camp period. And I just, I, I just knew that it was going to be easy to make a film of it. Not so easy, actually, as it turned out. But I think that um, we were really fortunate to have that. We were, the museum was really fortunate to have that piece of um, history in their, in their archive. Um, I, I know that I've not answered the question about how, how it has evolved, but I wanted to put in, get in a plug for the film. Um, <laughs> I, I think that 
what's, what's very interesting, you know, if you go back and see the film and you look at the VR piece, a lot of the content is the same. And that's because we try to pick the most interesting, the most captivating, the most characteristic of uh, you know, parts of Stanley's diary and his letters. And I, I'm so happy to say that I think we were in sync on that. I think the content really hasn't changed. What has changed, and this is something that we realized we could not do as well as, as uh, Noni and Emblematic did, and that is to make it come alive through animation. And the animation in our film is very, you know, one-dimensional, whereas the animation in this is just, you know, pops out. The other thing that we were able to do, which, which is one of, I think, uh, the hallmarks of, of virtual reality, is we weren't able to take you into the barrack and have you sit in it. And if you use the head headpiece with the and viewing it, you feel the the immediacy of being inside of Eric, which um, you know obviously we weren't able to do on film. Um, we and and in fact at the time I remember searching and searching for pictures for photographs of interior shots of barracks, and this is at a time when there was not as many archival photographs available. And it was hard to find actual photographs of interior barracks. That's not true today, because I think there's been a lot more research done. But that was a real important part of the story, because he was writing all of this inside his barrack. And so that's an element, I think, that is just, it, it makes it so much more present. Um, but again, I think Stanley's story is just, it's, it's, it's Stanley's story, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it's, the importance of this is that here is a young man talking about something very immediate to him while he is in camp. And for me, that meant a lot because it wasn't somebody going back, you know, person like 50 years later going back and talking about it. He was there at the time. So that, that's the thing I think that stays the same. Thank you. And, and now I have a question for Kurt. You know, we're always dealing with this idea of how do we continue to tell this story to future generations? And I'm glad to know that Kurt is the future <laughs> generation, so, and he is helping us to accomplish that with his participation. So my question to Kurt is, having grown up in a Japanese-American community yourself, what were your feelings when you were asked to portray a Japanese-American Nisei in a World War II concentration camp? And how did you approach the role of Stanley? Hello. Oh man, that was too much. <laughs> Shivering up here. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Clement. Super easy question. Um, it's, uh, I think, uh, you know, I grew up here in Los Angeles. Uh, I played basketball in the JA leagues here. I was in the all Japanese American Boy Scout troop, 764. I grew up in this history, um, not really knowing, uh, well, not really realizing how much of a uh, legacy it is. Um, I just grew up around it. And on the other hand, my grandmother um, is known as the Florence Nightingale of Hawaii for her work during World War II. She worked for the uh, Swedish Vice Consulate, and it was her job to go to all of the concentration camps and make sure that the Geneva Conventions were being followed, which is a very unusual position for a Japanese-American woman. So through her, I would understand a lot of the history and understand what the heritage was and what having a last name like Kanazawa meant in America. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's so everything in media is uh, ignoring th this part of story so much so that even in history classes, you know, it's maybe a sentence. And I I've participated in a lot of plays recently and, and, and pieces about uh, the concentration camps where people come up to me afterwards, after the production. Um, there was a play by Philip Kongotanda, uh, Sisters Matsumoto. Uh, it's produced by LA Theatre Works. And I had multiple people come up to me afterwards and ask me if what was, if it was real, 
if Japanese Americans were actually incarcerated and put into concentration camps. And this was not like some r random person. This was like this was like a forty year old like you know c citizen <laughs> in America. Like uh, it, it was it's, it's shocking, and it's also um, it repeats happens over and over again uh, every time I do some sort of um, and and I share that experience too with other Japanese American actors who do who have the who have the privilege to be able to do something where you get to be your, a, a a vestige of yourself um, of the history that you come from so this was so um, to be a part of this piece uh, and to be to even claim to to speak for for Stanley for the Hayami family is just an intense and immense privilege and I, I it can only exist because of the Japanese American National Museum if not for the people who came before us and if not for the for the same men who died to create this this place to create troop 764 to create the Japanese American basketball leagues to create my life here in Los Angeles um, I really I, it the way that I can only describe, uh, you know, what being a part of a piece like this uh, is really with just <laughs> endless words. I guess you know, I really can't say enough. It's too rare, and it's too um, it's too shocking that people don't know. And I'm, it's too it's such a blessing that somebody like Stanley had the foresight, perhaps or just was just so normal that he thought to put his his thoughts on paper and like uh we are so lucky uh so lucky for the family to have shared this with the museum and to you know entrust us to create a piece like this and to have many others hopefully to create so many more stories on top of this and so many stories like like Judy was saying you know you must talk about how you feel about it we need to talk about you know, uh, even just being part of projects like these, those little experiences that we we can only uh, uh, make happen uh, because uh, a piece like this is produced. So it means a lot. <laughs> and I'm super happy to be a part of it. And thank you. And I hope many more people can can see it um, in all of its digital footprints. Thank you, Kurt. Um, if you have not seen the VR piece, I highly recommend that you please come to the museum to, to, to watch it. When I hear Kurt's voice, I see Stanley's face. He's just, he's just grown on me to be the Stanley now. <laughs> so he's, he's just amazing. And I'm so grateful for his gratitude. I, I feel his sentiment. I know that all the things that we do in our community, from Obons to community centers to to the museum, to you know, community dances, to just little Tokyo, everything. It's really because of the, the struggles that the generations before persevered um, and, and, and kept alive. They didn't let them disintegrate or disappear, but they, they kept them going. You know, the, the act of mochitsuki is a crazy thing. You know, that they continue, there's so many places that still do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> they just pound it, you know, as, a, as an act of almost defiance that the, the Japanese American community wouldn't let that disappear, that they would continue to do it um, annually. So it's just an amazing thing. So, um, you two were able to go to New York um, and go to Tribeca and see the opening of this. So, my question to both of you was, um, can you talk about the audience responses to the work when you were um, at the opening for this? Um, that's, un unfortunately, that's a difficult question because, again, um, because this um, form is so new and so different, we don't get to see audience responses. We, it is done in a room where people are wearing headsets and uh, it's not like being in a big theater, uh, but it's it's it, it's hard to describe because I think you know we got to participate in all of the immersive pieces which were at Tribeca. It comprised a giant room that was filled with like five or six um, pieces that were that were. Uh, 
I don't, there's a different name for those pieces that were in that big room. But, but at any rate, it was this huge room, and then individual rooms were um, used for the individual pieces, because you don't need a lot of space to show this, because obviously all you need is a headset. So we, we weren't really privy. We didn't get to go in and watch people and, and hear their reactions. But I do know that it was sold out, that they had, they, you had to make an appointment, uh, you were, you were, you know, you were given like a certain period of time to look at the immersive pieces, and it was for a period of I think a week or two, and and the hours were sold out. So, um, I think the best reaction we got was by some of the press that had seen the piece and liked it, um, and that I think was very important. We were able to do a panel discussion with one of the virtual reality podcasters who um, obviously liked it. And, and also the thing that, that Noni said about it traveling more, Tribeca was very influential in getting the exposure of it for people who went there. And the, um, the programmers who went to Tribeca then ultimately decided they wanted to show it at their festival. So it was great in that way. So you knew that that was a very positive response. Um, I mean, going to Cannes after Tribeca was pretty impressive. Uh, you know, being at the Cannes Film Festival. And by the way, Tribeca, which I thought was really interesting, they, didn't, they don't call it the Tribeca Film Festival anymore. They call it the Tribeca Festival. And it's because of things like this, which are not film, that they've decided to change the title of, of the entire program. So um, it's, uh, it, as, as if Noni were here, she would probably um, be smiling because it's the, you know, the format of the future. Um, uh, I mean, I still like storytelling on film, so I, I give my vote for film. But <laughs> VR is really a different experience. I don't know if you have any comments about Tribeca. Or audiences in general. Yeah, uh, in general, uh, well, Tribeca was very fun. Of course, we got like a lot of really interesting responses, especially from the press um, folks. And it was also, to, to note, it's also, it's like the first festival that opened after you know after the pandemic it was the first major festival and so there was a lot of hesitation as well about like going to anything in person um and then after the first day it was like okay free for all <laughs> it was just like everybody was going to everything but there was a little bit of it was a little shocking uh, to be around that many people um but i would say i'm very excited to go to hawaii next week i'm actually going to go my family a lot of my family is there um Flights are crazy cheap, <laughs> but uh, not to encourage tourism. We should, know, but the uh, it, it, there is an element of Stanley's. What, what, again, what Judy was saying, just him traveling all over. It just feels so. Um, it, it's everything that he's ever want. He ever would have wanted, and he is everywhere. People, and it's not just the fame. It's just that. Everything that you know, I get to do. I get to travel around the world. I just uh, everything I, I think about. You know, him. I was living in Italy for three years, and it was never lost on me um, there. You know, of course, silently to myself, I wouldn't know really who to say to this to. But you know, in, in the same places that I would walk, I knew that there was definitely like four forty second soldiers who would walked in the same places. Um, not they didn't get to walk to Rome because they didn't get to uh, <laughs> walk the victory parade. Uh, it's a whole other s discussion. But um, yeah, I think it, the people who come to the museum, they're so um, overwhelmed, um, not over, in a good way, with just the, the exhibit, the way that, that Clement created. It's just they, they need to sit in these projections. And then when they, find, when they get to the VR piece, which is at the end of the exhibit of these like blown up um, uh, um, uh, writings, uh, pages, uh, just blown up on the wall. It's so, uh, I, every person who has come has, you know, even, you not when people see your things, they don't necessarily tell you all the time, but like, I, I feel like if everybody who has come to see this has, has called me directly or t told me, you know, something, and something different each time. It's never the same thing for some people. It's like, it's being in the barracks with other people. It's just like this one little moment of looking at the stars and it's just like there's something different. So I'm really and other people, it's the the gallery, you know, sitting in the space. So it's been it, the audience response is really great, and I hope that more people can 
continue to see it as it travels for many years to come, let's say. Knock on wood. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and, and one final question for both of you, the same question we asked uh, Judy and Dakota is, what can or should young people take away from Stanley's story? Sharon? Do you really expect me to top the answer <laughs> answers that Judy and Dakota gave? Um, I think I'm going to speak from my own experience about the reaction I get from young people when they see it. And I think I mean, I showed it to a group of elementary school kids. I, I'm sorry, I showed the film, which again, is the same story. Um, and there's such a sense of wonder, you know, about learning about this. I got a sense that they didn't know anything about it and they were learning. But what I really found so touching was they were really angry at what happened to Stanley. Because, you know, they were completely surprised to find out that he died. And it was, um, it was really interesting to see that they were very upset about that. You know, that, that I think that it gives you a sense of, for me especially, the, the horrors of war. You know, the fact that a, a young man so talented, so promising, ends up getting killed in a war that kills people. So I, I I hope that that's something that you know people take away with from this story. That you know it's 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 really sad that wars wars exist to do that. And um, I did also wanted to want to add because I think it's so coincidental. I actually have an uncle by marriage who is Stanley's cousin. Um, he, in fact, was one of the leaders of the Fair Play Committee. His name was Paul Nakadate. He was, in, he was the one that Stanley talked to when Stanley was deciding whether or not he should join the military. We only know this through Walt, which is um, uh, Judy's dad. He, he, he says this in interview after the fact. But um, Paul, and, and the sad thing about this is that Paul was one of the, he objected to it. He was one of the leaders of the Fair Play Committee. He ends up going to jail for his, for his stand. His family, of which, you know, my cousin's family, my, my uncle, I'm sorry, my uncle's family, it was such a source of shame for them that they never, ever spoke about it after the war. And the same went for Paul. And it was so tragic that he had to go through this um, but really standing up for his beliefs as well. So, um, you know, again, the, the perils of war and, the, pra and the, the fact that the government imprisoned people and forced that decision on them is really a story that I think is just so horrible. So again, I hope, I don't know if that answers it, but I hope people take away that part of the story as well. Yeah, I, for me, I think it's that everything that everyone has said. Uh, it's. But I would only add that history, Stanley's history is small, but Stanley's history is huge. You know, and I think that's something we can all take, that our history, our her story, our, their story is really small, but every what we do is actually, is huge. Like, it, you're part of, so many other things and so I mean I, I guess we should write it down <laughs> but like you did it was probably the takeaway but I'm, I'm so bad at keeping a journal but I think everybody has a story everybody has is a part of something and it, it just those little tiny things that you do in your life can um, create an exhibit like this it's just so but it, it, I think everybody has that capability you know, everybody comes from something. Everybody is a part of a, another kind of circle of history that's overlapping on your own. And so I think that's like something really important to take away from somebody as normal as Stanley. Um, I hope more people um, find other normal people to make stories like this about. 
um, and if they're Japanese American, <laughs> extra plus. But like, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that's my big takeaway. Well, thank you, Sharon and Kurt. Um, and like Judy was mentioning, if for people who are out there now who are listening, and if you do have relatives who are incarcerated, family members. You know, it's as simple as taking out your smartphone and pressing the record button and just starting to ask questions and just documenting those because those are the things that you'll want to have in the decades to come. It's, it's just the voice of, of those people talking about those stories. So we encourage you to do that. Um, I mean, if you ever have a chance to come to the museum, it's a, that's a great place to actually spark those conversations because people are reminded of things when they come to the museum to see these things. When they read Stanley's stories, it, it sparks memories about their times in camp. And you know, we have a lot of benches. <laughs> we have a lot of areas <laughs> where people can sit down and talk. Um, and I think we've, we've made it that way so that people can learn and share their own stories with their families. So with that, we're gonna close this part. Uh, give a big hand to um, Kurt and Sharon. <laughs> and Nani. And then we're going to go into the question and answer portion. So we're going to ask Judy to come back up. And Dakota will take over the mic. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Um, we do have some questions coming in online. I will ask first if anybody in the live audience here has any questions for us. All right, well, I'll give you guys time to think about yours while I move to <laughs> some of our online questions. And I've got to say, I'm very excited. A lot of Heart Mountain people out in the uh, YouTube chat tonight. Uh, so they really showed out for this program. Uh, always enthusiastic there. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with a question coming in from Karen out on the YouTube chat. Um, she is asking, will the Japanese American National Museum publish uh, Stanley's diary at some point? <laughs> Certainly, woman. Who's asking that question? <laughs> uh, that, is, that is Karen coming in from the chat. Um, you know, Karen, I've been getting that question a lot more lately. The Oppenheim book is one that does document the diary, so it is available there. There's also a link in our collections page of on the where the Hayami uh, diary is on the California Online Archive. Online Archive of California? OAC. Online Archive yeah. of <laughs> California. And you can Google Stanley Hayami and find the entire diary page by page. It's it's a great resource. Right. But but we don't have the book, the diary itself published. So it's something we're thinking about, but not, not in motion yet. And for those of you uh, who didn't catch when Sharon mentioned it earlier, the, the book that they're referencing is Joanne Oppenheim, Stanley Hami, Nisei Sun, now available in the online uh, Janum Museum store as well as the Heart Mountain online store. Um, our next question that we've got coming in is from David Fujioka, uh, nephew of our other great teenaged uh, war hero from Heart Mountain, Ted Fujioka. And uh, David asks about consideration of, in addition to a virtual reality film, uh, doing other formats of it, which I know you guys touched on a little bit, that this did project did sort of evolve. I wonder if you can dig into the ways it evolved just a little bit more. I guess I can answer that. Hi, David. <laughs> Thanks for asking a question. I'm not, I, I hope I, I, I answered it in part earlier. Um, the best resource, I, again, is Joanne Oppenheim's book. If you want to actually see the actual pages of the diary, and it's also annotated. So that's step one. Step two is the, our film, A Flicker in Eternity, which um, 
again, it, it's a different format, but you can see it in your home. We have DVDs. <laughs> you could actually get one for your for your for your own home, um, and then. And where it. are those DVDs available, Sharon? <laughs> I bet they're at the Heart Mountain Fount Art Interpretive <laughs> Center. I would guess, not to mention the Japanese American National Museum, which I just dropped off a big box. Clement <laughs> can also address the the availability of the Stanley Hayami virtual reality piece that can be done in so many different ways. Uh, uh, one of it, which, right? Clement, <laughs> you can actually stream it on your iPhone. So maybe you could talk about how that works. Hi, David. Yes, the video, if you come to the exhibition, is delivered three ways. One is as a theater presentation on a flat screen, single channel. The other is through an um, Oculus headset, fully immersive. And then the third way is on YouTube, streaming. If you come to the gallery, you'll be able to access it through um, QR codes. And soon, I mean, currently we just received our first batch of Stanley Hayami educational posters, which is sort of a condensed version of the exhibition, but also has the QR code. So if you send me an email, <laughs> I will send you a poster set if you'd like. All right, so I've got a question for Judy next. Um, so Susan, online, had asked, uh, did Stanley participate in the Boy Scouts in Heart Mountain? And she was talking about her father's own scouting experience. And I believe that earlier on, she had mentioned that her uncle also played trumpet in the swing band, which I think you can speak to uh, as Frank and Walt did as well. Um, but can you talk a little bit about uh, the sorts of activities at Heart Mountain for, for kids and teenagers? I'm, I'm not sure that Stanley was actually in the scout troop. I asked my father, Walter Hayami, if he was, and he said no, and I, I don't know why, but my dad was kind of shy. Um, but I know they had a scout troop. Um, Norm Minetta and Don Simpson, right, were Boy Scouts. That's how they met. Norm was in camp, and Don Simpson was not. But they met through a scouting experience. Um, they had basketball teams, baseball teams, um, they ice skated. I was surprised to hear that my dad ice skated because I never saw him on skates. I saw him fall off a, um, a board once, <laughs> a skateboard once, but I never saw him skate. But they, they tried to, I don't want to say, I, I guess bring a sense of normalcy to the camp experience. So they had football teams and, and as the war progressed and things loosened up a little bit. They competed against local teams. Am I correct in that, Dakota? They competed with local school teams and uh, took great pride in, in winning <laughs> a lot of the competitions. But Stanley himself, I'm not sure he was a scout. Um, we never came across any memorabilia that would indicate that he was, but I know there was a scout troop there. Thanks so much. Uh, we've got a question from Kelsey online, and uh, she asks if, uh, in response to the uh, virtual reality, if it affects people a different way than just watching video. If, uh, if you find with visitors who watch it, are uh, they more involved with the story? Uh, are they more emotionally affected? So if you could speak to a little bit about what's that's been like for, I guess, you personally, but also the folks that you've seen watch it. And we'll start with Kurt on this one. Um, virtual reality is difficult to watch a piece that can be emotional because if you cry, <laughs> you can't watch the piece anymore. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you can, but uh, but there is a there is definitely the sense that you're holding back. I mean, I'm not saying that like you know I cry to my myself, but I think that like the the um, it's really the, the what I've seen like when I watch people watch it, which is, has been an interesting experience. You know, a lot of them, yeah, when they they get out, I, I think they're wiping their eyes from tears. But it's also you know, it's a it's overwhelming. I think because you are you really I I personally had never as somebody who feels like they uh, like 
understand certain things or have learned it, I don't think I truly understood what a barrack felt like until I was in this piece. Like I didn't think about the sound of the barrack which sounds so elementary to say, but like I didn't think about how loud it was or how many people were in there. Like it, just that sense of uh, claustrophobia just sonically. Like there's a part where in the piece where Walt is playing his trumpet and, and, and Stanley is like, I just like can't think. I'm trying to write, you know, write here. And there's all these people, Ma and Pa are arguing and like there's this, uh, and then you see just physically in the piece how little space you have to move around and you try and move. Um, but you really don't have anywhere else to go. So I think that is the biggest thing. And even you know here at Janet, you know at at places there at the confinement sites, there are like you know elements of like models that exist. I'm sure you know as just not many people can go to to these sites. So like just to have this, it gives you that. I would imagine a similar feel. Um, but yeah. Um, well, I'm going to give the old person's um, take on this question because, um, believe it or not, when I first walked into Noni's um, office, studio, whatever, the first time, and she, I, she told me to put on this headset and I got to watch someone inside solitary confinement for, it was, uh, <laughs> I guess. A lot. <laughs> it was a lot. And, and in fact, um, you know, one of the, it, it's, it can be very, um, I'm not sure how to explain, uncomfortable, not only in terms of what you're involved in, but just wearing that headset, which is slightly heavy, slightly cumbersome, uh, feels a little claustrophobic. So I think, I'm saying the old people, but people my age and older, some might feel a little confined. So that's something that you have to get over um, as you watch the piece, sometimes watching it for a long period of time um, increases that sense of, you know, discomfort. I guess is how you'd say it. But I, 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 I think that if you can overcome the fact that you've got this headset on, um, it's well worth it because literally it's a different way of viewing the world when you're inside that headset. I get claustrophobic, <laughs> and I, I didn't feel it. I, I really didn't. It's like once it started, I just felt like I was there. Claustrophobic in the sense of a whole family being confined, confined to a limited amount of space, yes. Um, but I have visited Heart Mountain and Amachi, um, Colorado, and was inside barracks at both locations. And also the museum had a reconstructed barrack. Um, and so with the headset on, it felt the same to me. Um, I could almost smell the wood and feel the draft coming in um, because you can move around. And when you get a sense of how small the space actually is, and like you said, you see the other members of the family in there, you can imagine the conversation and the trumpet and, and the guitar playing all at the same time when you're trying to focus. And Stanley was very grade conscious on top of that. They didn't. I guess they didn't have separate study areas outside of the school or you know, a real library where you could get away from all of that. But I think it gives you a real sense of, of how it felt to be there. And when you think of how many days and how many seasons they went through the heat and the cold and the dust and everything, it, it really makes it real. Even like you said, even with the headset on, but maybe that even gives you a sense of the feeling of oppression having that on your head, you know, and it weighs on your shoulders. I, Judy, I'd love to, to you to tell how your mom reacted to it because she got to see it with the headset on. She on did, the very and she first said day. that. She said, it's heavy. And, <laughs> and she didn't walk around. The first time I saw it, I was standing up and I actually kind of tried to touch the table and feel the heat from the lamp. But um, she was amazed at the technology. And you know, when I first saw it, it was like, and I heard someone else say it too, it's like being on the holodeck of the Starship Enterprise because I'm not a gamer, so I don't, I was not exposed to anything like that until I put that headset on. It was, it's really, it's really an experience that you have to experience. 
<laughs> and I'm sorry, can I go back to Susan? I didn't answer your question about the band. I hope you're still there, Susan. My dad did play the trumpet in the swing band in, in camp. And afterwards, he would play with Tet Special. And my Uncle Frank played lap steel and what Dakota has just told me this evening in a band called The Surf Riders. They were on uh, radio outside of camp. And he also played guitar. Sorry, I had to go back. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, and I will just add from the museum perspective, we do run the VR on Saturdays all day. And we are always impressed by the fact that people who do decide to do the VR experience, they always stay through the entire piece. I thought 17 and a half minutes was a little long, but it's the piece does hold people because it's very compelling for the reasons that have been mentioned. Um, I also feel like there is a very cinematic quality to it in the sense that you know the beginning starts almost in pitch black and you hear Kurt, who's now Stanley, um, asking his mother for water. You know, like you often hear when people are dying, they they get very thirsty, and so it just starts out with this. It just grabs your attention, but in a complete darkness, and then from there it, it flashes back to the beginning of camp, and you know you can just imagine this, how he was, all the thoughts that may have passed through his head, you know, in those last moments. So I think it's just constructed in a very compelling way. And I think, you know, for us, you know, the VR is an, just an extension of the Bible. I mean, of the Bible, <laughs> the, 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 the diary. It is a Bible to us, though. Um, but it's an extension of the diary. What I mean is, you know, Marshall McLuhan said, um, the wheel is an extension of the foot. So your foot is obviously a tool, but when they invented the wheel, you could do so much more with your feet. You could go to the mountains and walk and stuff. Likewise, the VR piece is just an extension of the diary. But we wanted to make sure that the diary didn't become secondary to that extension. We wanted to make sure whatever was in the VR could point back to the diary so that, again, why do museums exist? It's because we are the holders of these primary source materials. The VR is a, an amazing experience, but it should always go back to the Bible, I mean, the, the diary, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the, the, the diary, sorry. Thanks, Limit. And actually, that's a great lead in. We have time for just one last question here. And so I wanted to ask something along those lines. You know, the exhibit, obviously, a big uh, core part of it is around this virtual reality experience. But it's more than that. You know, there's a more traditional film that folks can watch. There are uh, uh, films from camp, home movies from camp that feature into this. There are, of course, reproductions of di the diary pages on the walls. There are the original artifacts, including the diary itself. There are animations that are made from Stanley's cartoons within this that are projected on spaces. And uh, so I've got to ask beyond that, what's next for this project? You know, both what is immediately planned and, and what do you guys dream uh, that, that this could become going forward? Uh, we'll we'll start with Judy start, and work our way there. back. Okay, um, I, you know I'm sorry I haven't visited all the little nooks and crannies of the the museum website, but I know at one time um, there was a school curriculum available to teachers online for students, and a, a good friend of mine for years and years taught eighth grade, and she worked it in with the government and social studies faction of their studies. And she brought them to the museum every year. So I'm hoping when field trips start up again that some educators, formal and informal educators, will um, take advantage of that information and bring it into the classroom and then bring the classroom here to experience everything the museum has to offer. Even if this exhibit isn't still going, I think it's a, a very worthwhile trip. Um, the exposure at the, the film festivals and the events, uh, it's, it, like you said, it's taken the story worldwide. I, I hope it continues. I hope people really take it to heart. I'm old school. I would suggest that you buy the book um, because then you can stop and think about what you're reading as you're reading it and go back to things that you liked and take a look at the illustrations and be inspired by, by the words and the pictures 
and the thoughts that Stanley was trying to convey. Okay, I, I, I repeat everything Judy just said. Um, one of the things that I like to encourage people to do after they have seen Stanley's story is to realize the importance of saving artifacts and how they can tell so much about things that you think are unimportant. So those of us who have all these piles of, of like photographs and that you think these are unimportant, I, I think that it's it you know it can you can widen the the breadth of knowledge about the camp period if you are able to save those things and share them. Um, I didn't realize how important it was till I started doing research in this field and realized that there's so little in the way of diaries and letters that are um, available, you know, and, and I, I know that the collections of, of this museum is filled with those kinds of things, but I, I still encourage it because I think it's so important. My mom, the hoarder, is thrilled that she just said that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, I have two things really practical and one thing big picture. Two things I really hope happen with the film. One is that, like Judy said, it's incorporated into curriculums um, or incorporated into field trips somehow. It's such a, it's 18 minutes of a day. Like, that's not, that's, you know, there's a whole separate discussion of is 18 minutes enough to talk about any period of history? But like if a school curriculum could incorporate 18 minutes, they would really understand a lot about you know the Japanese American experience during the war. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the second thing I want, I would hope that it. No, uh, Nani had mentioned this. Uh, you know, I hope it gets onto the Facebook marketplace. There is a Facebook has. <laughs> I hate to even be talking about this, but it has changed their name to Metaverse. So, like, literally is all about VR. Like, it's, you know, it, it, their stock ticker has changed the, meta, like, the Metaverse. So it's like, if this piece can exist there somehow for sale, and the proceeds go to Janum, or <laughs> in some way, or free, um, so that we can achieve the first goal, that would be great. And then third, big picture-wise, I just hope, as an actor, I mean, you know, to portray somebody who is like you um, and have it be so full and real and and nuanced because that's what a human being is. It's like so rare to do. And so I really hope that somebody, that people continue to make things like, like this piece so that we can show, uh, demonstrate humanity in so many different ways. And, and, and I'm not just talking about this period. I mean, also, like just what, what Clement was, or I think who said this earlier, that the, because the, or Judy was saying that because the museum didn't exist for so, for these this like decade period, two decade, three decade period, four, <laughs> how much was lost in here? And also how much other history is happening in there? It's so fascinating, the 60s, like just, everything that people are doing to get away from this history and creating this whole other sort of dynamic. Like when, what I take away from what Judy was saying too about like talking about your experience with it, it's not just people in camp, it's also the people after who are like going through their parents who aren't gonna talk about this and then you have this like strange lifestyle that you're going through and then find, you know those those little things too, I think it's, um, just documenting even that is, is history in itself. And so I, I'm so curious now about that. I never really thought about that huge gap uh, between people not having a place and how much has been lost and how much can still be found because we're going to be positive and that's what. <laughs> um, so I will be the last one to answer that question, I think, um, or maybe Dakota will be. <laughs> but having heard all of these people talk, I think there should be a one-person show of Kurt playing Stanley. That sounds like an interesting <laughs> idea. Um, in the gallery, <laughs> while the museum's open to the public. Only for Janet. Yeah. Only. Maybe on a family day we can think of something. Um, the museum has produced, a, as a result of this exhibition, we've taken the digital assets from that um, exhibition and created a poster set. So it's a seven poster set that has a condensed version of everything that you see in that exhibition plus a QR code 
So again, like I mentioned earlier, if you want to email me, we can go ahead and just mail those to you. If you want to um, send them to teachers, I'll make sure Judy <laughs> takes them when she leaves. Um, <laughs> that's one of the things that we are working on right now. We are also hoping to travel the exhibition. I'm talking to this fine man here, Dakota, about traveling it to Heart Mountain because obviously that's a, a natural location yeah, that we yeah, want it so. to appear. If you do visit the exhibition, 90% of that basically is digital. You know, so that we, we are implementing, we are utilizing the technology in ways that we wouldn't have in the past. Traveling it makes it that much more easier. I can send digital files to Wyoming and have it, most of it printed out and send a smaller crate to, with all the artifacts and stuff like that. Um, and then we are hoping that with this poster set, we will be able to send them to schools across the state of California, as well as nationally to whoever requests. Um, and then we do have a mandate to go to several libraries and that's because two of our funders, one is the National Park Service, Japanese American Confinement Sites Grants was, the, was probably the biggest funder, but also the California Civil Liberties Public Education Program, um, which is funded by California, obviously. Um, they were also a big sponsor and the idea of getting this story to the public libraries. And so again, with Nani's work of making this streamable on, on, on the internet, makes that so much more easy to access to every um, public library in California and beyond. Well, you guys, it's so fantastic at that. I have very little else to add except to, to second Clements that uh, take that where you are excited to bring it up to Heart Mountain. Uh, this is gonna be a great thing. Oh, one more question from the audience there. Yes, absolutely. Uh, um, was just adding uh, recognition to David Ono, who's done a lot of storytelling with his documentary Legacy of Art Mountain, of course, and then is is talking about and exploring going to Europe and exploring more of the 442nd project uh, or history as well in a future project. So, very exciting. Um, well, I do want to thank all of our panelists for tonight, um, and I want to thank everyone who came here in person and also everyone who is watching online. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you tonight. We're looking great forward to a great weekend of Japanese American Confinement Sites Consortium activities. So I hope to see many of you online uh, here tomorrow for our workshop sessions for that. Uh, but can we end with just a big round of applause for our panelists? <laughs>